get started? We're live. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Curtin. Uh, I work for Rackspace. I'm Terry Howe. I work for HP. And uh, we're the two, uh, one of the two of the main developers of the OpenStack SDK project. Uh, it's a project that was started, uh, I think, December or so of, or the conversations were started about December of, of 2013. Um, so it's been around for a little over a year now. Um, the first time we kind of got together and talked about it with, uh, with a bunch of folks was in, in the Atlanta Summit. Um, had a nice design session to, to get together and, and figure out what we all really wanted to do to improve the user and developer experience uh, within OpenStack. Um, and that's you know, where we are today. So why? So uh, the, the talk's going to cover, cover a couple of things. Um, who, I guess who is familiar with the OpenStack SDK today? Ed, one of the developers <laughs> who had worked on it for a while, a little bit. Um, so we'll talk a bit about you know, the current state of things, um, why we wanted to do this, and then we'll dive into you know, how things are structured, how they're set up, and how, how we're going to move forward and, and, and with this project and how, how things will be better. So um, when you look at what's out there today, um, each OpenStack server offers its own client. Uh, so there's one library per service. And you're probably familiar with these. These are the Nova client, Glance client, Swift client, all those clients. Uh, if you look on between the, uh, the StackForge and, and the OpenStack repos, there's something like 30, 30 or so clients. Uh, I mean, no one's really building an application that uses all 30 of these. But you, you can imagine when each library, uh, you know, each service has its own library. Each of those provides basically their own user experience. They're all structured a little bit differently. They're all developed a little bit differently. They all have their own different dependencies. Um, that kind of mounts up, and, and all of a sudden you're looking at uh, a pretty complex um, application. You're already, I mean, if it's a distributed system that's already, already adding complexity by being multiple services, and, and that complexity by itself is already, already daunting. And to look at you know, all the different APIs, all the different return contracts, all that kind of stuff is, is not a great, great thing. So if we look deeper beyond just the fact that each thing has its own, serv uh, its own client, um, you start to see a lot, of, a lot of issues right away. There's duplication in the way a lot of things are created. Um, there's re-implementation of things. Um, a lot of different clients have their own HTTP layer. They have their own connection pooling. There's a couple that have you know, duplicated efforts there. If you see some of the more recent clients, you can kind of see their, their inspiration or their, the place they copy and pasted from another one. Um, dependencies is a much better solution today in, in all of this, uh, you know, a year or, or two years ago, this was, was a pretty, um, pretty much a mess. Um, especially when you look at, okay, I want to I want to use Keystone Client, I want to use Glance Client, I want to use a couple of these clients. Uh, it was at times tough to have them in the same virtual environment. So you're going to have different segregations of, of where you're writing your code, just based on the fact that you have to do it at all. Um, and and the APIs are, are different than a lot of these things. Um, some of that's gotten better over time. Um, if you look at things like Swift Client, it is structured massively differently than any of the others. And especially for some of these, you really have to have knowledge of how the server is, is doing things and, and what it's calling things. And, and it, there's no really consistent view across, across all of this. So again, once, even if you're using two or three services, there's a lot of differences. And there's really no way to just talk to OpenStack. There's a way to talk to, to Nova. There's a way to talk to Glance. There's a way to talk to all these other projects, but you can't just talk to the cloud. You can't talk to, so if I'm a Rackspace guy. You can't talk to just Rackspace. You can't talk to just HP. Piece together a bunch of things and make your own experience on top of that. Um, it's a couple, a little example I'm going to show is, is how this all adds up, all these differences. So the, the basic operation of just listing resources uh, for a particular service. Uh, and the examples I chose are that there's, I'm going to list some servers list some images and list containers in Nova, Glance, and Swift. And before I do this, I'm not trying to shame anyone. I'm not trying to like, make fun of this code. It's, it's an example of, of, of the experience we have today. Uh, these, all these clients are created um, with the express consent of uh, the, the goal of talking to that service. They're not trying to be anything that's consistent, but we end up seeing that this, this is what we, what we live with. So to list servers, you create a client with some authentication arguments. You call your connection.servers.list, iterate over that, and you print out the, the dot .name attribute of, of a server object. Uh, Glance looks kind of similar. 
takes different arguments to clients uh, to wait the way it's created, but it looks similar enough already. Now we're doing images.list. Looks very similar to what we had uh, in the, the Nova one, but now we're, we're printing, it was the, what we're getting back from that list call is a dictionary. So it's a little bit different there. Uh, look at what we do uh, to list containers in Swift. Uh, it's called a different thing. It's not called a client now. It's called a the connection class. Takes different arguments again, uh, and again for for different reasons. Um, Swift can be run independently, so it has its own its own auth system. So it does things differently, and there's there's reasons for these things. Um, but to now to get my containers, I'm calling get underscore count, uh, and I'm getting back a tuple, iterating through that and, and looking at the name uh, key in the dictionary. So I spot the differences. Uh, a lot of things add up. I think it's like 13 or 14 differences in that. I mean, they're called different things. Uh, when you look at that list call, when, whether it was servers that list in no, the Nova client or it's uh, the images that list in Glance, one of those, and I can't remember which one it is now, one returns an actual list, one is a generator, then the, then the Swift client one is returning a tuple. Uh, those are all very different. What they're returning, whether it's an object that has the attributes that correspond to the resource or dictionary keys, um, all that kind of stuff adds up. And this is only three things. Um, add two more services in there, you're going to get somehow more types of returns, more types of, of, of things that are coming out of it. Um, and it's especially difficult when you add in the, the Swift client one, which requires you to know how the, how the REST API is structured. Because it's called git underscore account because it's doing a, an HTTP git on your account URL. Um, if you do, if you want to get the metadata, it's head underscore account. Um, that's not something that an application developer, a, you know, a consumer of a cloud for, for many of the number of vendors out there, wants to have to know. Um, so after seeing this and, and, and having experiences talking to customers at, at, at things like OpenStack Summit and at other conferences and trying to understand what people want to build and, and why they want to build it and how they want to build it, uh, they don't want to know, see those differences. They want to have to care about how the REST API is structured. They just want to know they want to get servers, they want to get images, and they want to get containers. And we decided that's time to, to build one thing that can do that. So in the end, all of these, these libraries are REST clients. There's no need to have 30 REST clients to talk to 30 REST APIs when they all do roughly the same thing. Um, they all have resources that we're talking to. And we can have one representation of what a resource is and then use that from Python. One set of APIs, we don't need to have different uh, method names for different for the same things in different services. And you know, we can can provide you know a, a nice consistent look across the board, uh, and, and one set of dependencies. Maintaining an application that would use all three of those, uh, the examples of the Swift client, Nova client, Glance client. You know, they all have they all depend on different things, and that kind of starts to add up, especially when you have your own application um, dependencies. All of a sudden, you're looking at your dependencies list of 50 things to just do talk to a REST API not really necessary. And the SDK itself being one project becomes one dependency for you to worry about. You don't have to worry about three or five or whatever services. Um, so the goal with this is to get down to one thing. It was originally called the unified SDK to provide a unified view, but we moved away from being you know, unified as part of the name. And so what, this is, what the SDK is, is one package that currently is focused on application developers. Uh, these are the people who are going to be consuming an OpenStack cloud from whatever vendor it is, from DevStack, from the private cloud, from something you've built yourself, something you're consuming someone else. Uh, and you're, you're trying to build applications, you're trying to build a business on this, you're trying to put web apps, whatever you're doing. Um, it's also one source of documentation and examples. It's the one place to get uh, what, it, what it takes through Python to talk to an OpenStack cloud. Um, one thing I'm sure some people are familiar, familiar with, is anyone familiar with OpenStack client? So if you're not, OpenStack clients, and, and so what I'm talking about so far with SDK is that it's a, a, a library. Uh, it does not have anything to do with command line tools. So if you look at like Glance client and all these other clients, they're both libraries and command line tools. OpenStack client is currently a command line tool that wraps a lot of those other clients to provide one consistent, nice view um, on top of those. OpenStack client will remain as a command line tool and SDK will be a library, is a library, and there's a, a goal uh, over time to make OpenStack client consume SDK 
for its communication to the other services instead of working through all those other clients. So they're related, they'll, they'll work together, but they're not the same thing. And so uh, Terry's going to talk about kind of how we're going to do this. Um, yeah, you, this, uh, you can hold on to that, I guess. Um, so part of how we're going to do this is uh, we kind of have like a, a, a stack, a kind of protocol stack on top of our, our cloud, starting with the uh, transport, actually, and um, then with the session on top of that, which actually holds the authentication information. And then there's a connection on top of that, which kind of ties it all together and makes it convenient for your services. Um, the transport uh, kind of derives off the request library. Uh, so it's just doing the, the HTTP part. Um, so we have one base resource class, and it drives off of, a, uh, I forget exactly what the class is, but it's immutable map, and it, it's basically like a, a dictionary. It acts, can act like a dictionary, but we have uh, a lot of methods on top of that to actually do the our <coughs> gets and uh, creates, et cetera, on top of that for that resource, more specific to the transport. Um, then we have a base proxy, and the proxy itself um, is supposed to act as a higher level. Um, and within the connection class, um, the, the, uh, the proxies will um, provide the interface that the user will actually see. So uh, for each service, there's a proxy, and it would, uh, the proxy itself would uh, define all the methods for uh, creating the particular resources, whatever they are. Um, in order to install the uh, SDK right now, um, uh, you just pip install Python OpenStack SDK. Uh, we released um, 0 0.5 yesterday, um, and you know it's been uh, 24 hours, and there hasn't been a single bug fix release yet. So we're pretty happy about that. And uh, that's, that's about it. <laughs> Don't deploy this to production yet. <laughs> <clears throat> this is kind of what the uh, the connection class looks like as far as use, uh, using it. Uh, basically, it's taking um, just your, uh, at a minimum, your authentication information. There's more inf uh, parameters you could pass here. Um, you could uh, potentially pass a, uh, an authenticator or a session to this thing. But if you don't pass it, it'll make one for you based on uh, your auth parameters. Um, I guess the next slide. Um, one of the, the most important parameters that you might want to pass other than uh, your auth parameters is the, the user profile. And the user profile is the way that it defines um, exactly what your uh, preferences are for this connection. And one of the preferences could be uh, the region that you want to access. So this is where we kind of handle the uh, defining exactly which service we want to access. And there's several parameters to this. Uh, region is given in this example, but there's also the service name. You could use a particular name that you want. Um, uh, the, uh, the visibility of the URL, if you wanted a public URL, internal URL, or admin URL. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the version would be the other big thing, if you wanted you know, V2 or V3, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and so, um, yep, once you're connected, then you can actually access the services. And I'm not exactly sure what you want. Uh, the the plug-in one. The plug-in one? Yeah. Oh, right. OK, yeah. That's the, yeah. So within this connection class, there's also uh, the ability to provide a, uh, a name for an auth plugin. And this is kind of supposed to show that um, you know, you could provide a, your own auth authentication plugin, and you just provide the name here, and it'll load that plugin. We we support. Uh, you know, we took the uh, our auth plugins from KSC, and they're very similar. And we've been trying to keep in sync with uh, KSC, mean uh, meaning the Keystone client. Um, and they're very similar to what's out there in Keystone client now. But there's also the capability to create your own plugin. Uh, to authenticate in any way that you might find convenient. And you can pass that in there on the connection. This, this is something where uh, vendors who have different authentication systems or have other things to, to provide uh, will do this. So right now I have work for Rackspace, and we have diff different auth. We're not Keystone auth. And so I have a very simple plugin that will allow you to just say, um, 
it, once you've once you've imported that, it creates an entry point, and then I would just say auth plugin equals Rackspace, and then any credentials I pass through there know how to go to the, the Rackspace identity service, and, and then auth, auth, auth me back, and, and then we'll move on. Uh, I expect other other um, vendors will have to do you know, or will provide similar things, and it, you know you don't have to worry about your your auth URL that's taken care of inside the plugin, so it's nice to just say off to HP, off to Rackspace, off to Morantis or whatever it is. And they'll take care of the details of that. So the uh, authentication plugins, as I mentioned before, were based on the Keystone Auth plugins, and we've been keeping in sync with their changes. Um, um, I guess later on we're going to talk about some other stuff as far as authentication plugins, but that's moving forward. Um, our, the, one of the major differences between uh, our Auth plugins and what's out in Keystone Client is the Keystone Client ones contain a lot of CLI options, which don't make a lot of sense uh, for the SDK because uh, you know we're not trying to describe what a CLI looks like, and we don't want to tell the CLI folks what their options should, you know, be called or anything like that. So we've kind of removed that and just had well, these are the arguments that you need. So we have a, like a valid options list instead of this uh, CLI options that KSC uses. Another part of taking that out for us was it decreased uh, a dependency. Uh, Brian was talking before about you know, the number of dependencies. And what we've tried to do is really keep our set of dependencies down to a very minimum uh, that you need to run. And uh, the Keystone client was using uh, you know, Oslo config, which is great. But it added uh, a lot of dependencies to the SDK, which we didn't want to add anything that you know, wasn't absolutely necessary. So um, as far as the basic service layout, uh, I was talking about the proxies before. And this is kind of where they play in. Um, when you create your connection, the, the proxy objects, uh, depending on what services you, you've requested, get loaded into these uh, service names. And so you know, rather than uh, use the service names uh, that we're kind of all familiar with, you know, Nova Glance, uh, Cinder, et cetera, our service names are based on the actual service they provide, which should give a more, uh, you know, uh, more intuitive uh, you know, for the user, for most users anyway, not necessarily OpenStack users. So we're using compute, image, object store instead of, you know, Nova, uh, Glance, and and uh, Swift here. And then within that, that's how you get down to access the methods for that particular service through the connection. And so um, we're supporting, uh, have some support, at least some level of support for 13 services currently. Uh, some of it's pretty good and some of it's you know, just a bare minimum. Um, but adding the new services and the new resources uh, tends to be fairly easy. So. Yeah. And while we were building this out, in order to come up with some nice APIs and get a, an understanding of, of what we're actually doing there, uh, we chose the path of go as wide as we can and you know, as deep as we need to. So that's what we, we ended up with these 13 services and we figured out like looking at a couple things to see, okay, uh, implementing this service is the same as one we've already, we've already done. So maybe put that off later and find something that looks a little bit different. So like if you look at the, the Swift APIs, they're very different than anything else. So we went pretty deep on that one to make sure we understand how that is. And we've come across a number of differences. Um, and so we, you know, we try to dive in and, and do these things and come up with, uh, enough of an exercise to have created something, a, a good solid base to build on. So that's why you'll see if you look at something like um, or the compute stuff for Nova is, is quite, quite complete. But if you look at something like Barbican, that's one we only got, I think there's two or three calls uh, out of that one. And again, like we were just saying, it's pretty easy at this point now that we've gotten enough of those methods uh, implemented to go add new stuff is, is, is not too hard, especially adding a new service. Um, and we're going to start building up documentation for a lot of that stuff. Uh, if you work on any of the, any of the servers and want to have uh, your stuff in, in the SDK, we'd love to help you. It's, it's not too hard to get started. And so if, if we look at what we had before with those, uh, the Glance, uh, Nova, and uh, Swift examples, we could just cut it down to one set of connection arguments passed to one connection, and then just call compute.servers, image.images, object store that containers and it's going to return each of those are generators each of those returns resources that correspond to the, directly to the the resource you get from the uh, the server so servers is going to give you a server object that has a dot name that has a um, 
you know, .IP, stuff like that. Images, the same thing. They all have a name. You know, they all look roughly the same, uh, and they correspond pretty, pretty closely to what's on the, on the REST API. And then so for one particular resource, so if you're looking at uh, any given service, um, assuming the, the resource is able to, to support these, these methods, um, you know, there are some, some things like if you look at flavors, um, you, know, you can't do all of these ap operations on a flavor um, unless you're like an admin or something like that. So it's not typically there. That, but in, in the, the general you know, CRUD operations, everywhere they're structured the same way. So that's a consistent view, whether it's create, update, delete, find, get, uh, whatever it is. Um, if, you, if you have a resource that follows all these, they'll follow the same convention everywhere. Uh, and that's uh, when we're talking about servers, all of these are in there. So you know, create server takes the attributes that it would take to create a server. Update takes an existing server and then can update whatever attributes. Delete just takes a, um, a server and deletes it. Find will do, and find we're gonna build out, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, find will do some type of searching to find like pattern matching based on name or based on image or based on other things. Um, Git will do another Git on that server. So sometimes when you do like listing servers, you don't get a full detailed look. You get some, some higher level view uh, where you can get just the, the name, image, and flavor. If you do a get again on that, you get the full details of you know, when it was updated, all kinds of stuff like that. And for listing uh, multiple resources per, you know, per that type of API, we've chosen to be named after, so it's the plural version of that resource. Instead of being something like list underscore servers, um, because we're working with generators, the list name looks a little confusing. It's, it's sure it is listing things off of the REST API but it's not creating a list. Um, so we, we, we chose this way, hopefully people like it. If not, you know, we're not locked into anything. This is pretty early, as you saw, 0 0.5. So um, we wanna make things that people wanna use. So if that's not a, a clear thing, um, certainly say so. Uh, we're, you know, we're open to, to building things people wanna use, obviously. Uh, because it is a generator and the way generators are typically used in iteration and filters and stuff like that, um, in a lot of the, the tests we've, we've been doing for usability and stuff like that, it's, it ends up working pretty well for us. Uh, but we're five people that are working on it, so we don't obviously can't speak for everybody. And then, you know, if you look at apply that everywhere else, uh, you see the same thing. So where you would do create server, you would do create network, create everything, um, and hopefully that that leads to a much easier um, experience to use. There's less on your mind when you don't have to think about. Uh, like in the Swift example, you would have to do, I think it's, it's either put or post underscore container to do one. So you have to know whether, how, it's, how it's doing it, the, the REST API is structured to do those operations. And so getting to one, one, one consistent you know, prefix for these hopefully is a much better um, experience for everyone. Yeah, so this is an example of uh, a little bit more detailed example of how you would actually create a server. Um, and in order to do this, um, uh, we're doing a find basically by name on our image and flavor first. And that find is returning an image resource and a flavor resource. And within that, we're taking that and putting it in <coughs> our create server um, command. And uh, I guess one of the, you know, uh, Brian worked on this, but this is one of the interesting kind of features that we have that, that this particular um, property of the server could either be um, um, an ID for that image, or it could be a resource. Um, so uh, that's fairly powerful. Like if you knew the ID of your image that you wanted to use, um, you could just provide the ID as a string and you would save the extra uh, rest call. But in this case, we're, we don't know. We just have a, a, a name that we're kind of looking for. Well, we're looking for a particular um, you know, operating system of some sort. So we're gonna just try and find one. And so that's what we're doing here. And so these named arguments, as I said below, uh, and I was kind of alluding to, I refer directly to the attributes within the server class, the server resource class itself. And updating is kind of an extension to that. It does a lot of the same things in that um, it's, it's, the arguments uh, consist of just a, the server you want to update, um, or really any of the other APIs, the, the object you want to update. And the keyword arguments beyond that are, are the fields that would be sent uh, in, in the, the call. So for, for servers, all you can do is really update the name. So 
given a server that already exists, set name equals something else, call update, and it's going to send that along. Um, that one's pretty easy to, to, to grasp, I hope. I guess as far as the update, too, you could also you know, do server.name and set it to something else there and then call update without the parameter. So it's kind yeah. of flexible that way. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, kind of on the same theme that I was talking about before where you can use a string or a, or a resource. Um, here we're showing that you could, uh, when you're doing a get server, you could pass a string with the actual ID of the server that you want to get. And, or you could actually have the server uh, or a server resource maybe that you got out of a find or um, uh, out of a create perhaps and you want to get more details on it. Uh, you could pass that resource to the get command and uh, get the, ser the server details. So um, it um, kind of makes that mapping between IDs and resource uh, somewhat transparent to the user. And especially if you look at something like the, uh, here in the create server, those, those keyword, arg the arguments to that, um, making it so it, it is transparent, so it doesn't matter whether you have an ID or you have that. Um, we don't have that fleshed out everywhere uh, because we've you know, been trying to get uh, the APIs right and everything. And so we have a, a bunch of places where that works to where uh, some places take, there's like, well, you'll see later, there's going to be a script we show that does network stuff. And it takes an ID. You have to pass it the ID right now. We're going to catch up on a lot of the stuff to where you'll never have to worry about if it's an ID or the resource. Because as we were kind of just saying, the um, you know, IDs, Everything is an ID, and so these these resource, resource classes are a wrapper on that. It's almost like a subclass of int or you know, string or whatever it is in a way that they're you know they're, they're interchangeable. Um, so if you look at delete, it, it is a pretty basic thing. Again, it takes an ID slash a um, resource, and the one the one thing we've kind of added here is the fact that you can recover from a delete if it's if it's a 404. It doesn't really matter so much, uh, or it may not matter. Uh, if you're trying to delete something and it's already been deleted or it's you passed the wrong ID or something like that, you may want to just be able to ignore that rather than always have to do it like a try catch based on if it's a 404. So that's one little uh, an additional parameter now that we, we allow you to say, just ignore it. Uh, so it, 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 it always succeeds whether or not the operation uh, did. Um, and the same thing, you know, we do a, um, a method on the list we kind of talked about earlier where um, so list is going to return a generator uh, that will handle pagination. So it'll handle whether or not it's paginated, and it will properly keep yielding as, as many objects as you have. There are a lot of, of APIs in, um, in uh, most of the OpenStack services that are in list form, uh, and a bunch of them are configurable on the server to be um, uh, paginated, and there are a couple that are just always, you know, they're, they're done by default. So when you're calling this, an additional parameter that's in there is to say to paginate it or not. There are, there are going to be times where, depending on how your server is configured, if it's your own private cloud and you know that you guys always turn on pagination, you always turn it off, um, we can only really configure so much of this to know, you know, we, we know based on like the defaults that are in the, the documentation to say, hey, this is something that supports pagination and it's turned on and handle that. And so what we end up doing there is make a request for something that we know is paginated and go and then so we, you know, we set the limit and marker based on what we get. So we try to, do whatever the, the, the default is, is, say it tries to get 100 items, do another request to see if we got, if we get less than 100, okay, we got less than that page size. If we get 150 things, stop requesting. If you, keep, if you get another 100, you got a full page, try again, try again. And it's transparent to the user that um, we're making multiple requests. We certainly are, but you never know because it's a generator. So you're getting, you're making a request and it just keeps iterating until it's over. Um, additionally, this is one of the areas we, we've been working on lately that um, want to be able to limit what, uh, what's coming back. Uh, a lot of these ones that are paginated take uh, query parameters in the, the REST API. So this is something where, in this example, we're going to look for servers that start with my server and they run um, the image that we've you know, already found. And so if we had 10,000 servers, this is going to come up with anyone that's got that prefix and that image. And hopefully, at that point, we're not paginating through 10,000 servers and filtering the client. We're going to get back 100, and then we can do our own filtering from there. 
So find, we still have some work to do on this one. Um, uh, it, it works off, uh, currently it's working off of get, so it tries to kind of determine whether you're passing in a name a parameter. And this method uh, is very handy for, you know, I, before I was working on the SDK, I was doing a lot of work on the OpenStack client. And, you know, it's a constant battle where you're passed in a parameter uh, from the command line and you're not sure if it's a name or an ID. And you can kind of make a guess, but still it's not a sure thing. So this is something we use all the time over there. Where, uh, so it, what this find does that we've implemented um, is it does a get on the whatever's passed in. And if it finds it, then it assumes it was an ID. And then it, if that doesn't work, it uses the uh, list command that we were talking before or tries to search for that name within all of the different uh, attributes of that, or you know, uh, resources. Um, and um, we, we still need to do some work because uh, part of the problem is that uh, not all the services provide a, a decent query filter uh, that we can actually use. So we try and, uh, you know, we may say, you know, pass in name equals whatever it is, and some services that just doesn't work. And it's not actually across services either. It can be varied by resource uh, that we found. So trying to put something in there that's a little bit smarter than what we have. Because if you have 10,000 containers, you know, we don't want to have to iterate through all 10,000 of them and then find something. If we could find it iteratively um, and add some smarts that uh, I mean, container is a bad example because it does support some of this stuff. But, uh, Anything that's you know, giving you huge amounts of data, anything we can mi minimize the amount of REST calls we're making is obviously a good thing. It would be faster. Um, you know. So uh, kind of moving forward, uh, what we've got going on, there's been a lot of talk lately about uh, writing a Keystone auth um, package, and it started, and uh, the idea of this package is it's going to just contain, well, I don't know, there's a couple ideas about this package, but one of the ideas is it's going to contain all the auth plugins. And that'll free up the SDK from being responsible for uh, trying to support all these auth plugins. Um, and it'll also allow other applications that don't necessarily want an SDK to use, you know, they just want auth plugins. Um, so hopefully uh, we're going to convert over, get rid of our auth plug plugin copies and go to this Keystone auth. Um, another thing that we have going forward is this idea of service plugins. And we've got, uh, there's, you know, uh, there's a, a change request out there that's got a, this, a service plugin capability where if you had a, a proprietary uh, a service with your particular provider, or maybe you were uh, working on a StackForge project that uh, you know, wasn't necessarily a popular project yet, uh, you could write your own plugin to the SDK and take advantage of you know, a lot of the the uh, higher level interface, the authentication, the session handling, the transport, all that kind of stuff that uh, we've been working on. And so this, that service plugin would work, uh, you know, using entry points and uh, that kind of thing. And this service plugin, uh, you know, it could be a good way to, to discover uh, how to structure uh, you know, an API for, for a newer service rather than coming into SDK and, and all of a sudden, you know, you're we're releasing it, and now you have backwards compatibility. You know, to think about if someone's you know building a new service, it's probably better for them to live you know outside of the SDK in like more provisional state. Be a plugin, iterate on your own time, figure out exactly how you want to build your API and how you want to um, you know the experience you want to build and all the all the features. Do that outside, and then at some point. Um, in, in, integrate your service and, and your your support into the SDK because right now. Um, we're not closed off to any particular type of service. Um, it doesn't, you don't have to be in the integrated or incubated, stuff like that. Um, there are StackForge projects that are currently in there. Uh, we have minimal support for the CDN service. Uh, OpenStack Poppy is what it's called. Um, there's also... What's Barbican the, is still... Uh, yeah, Barbican is still newish. Stack there's uh, project, yeah. um, one of the telemetry, Nokia, yeah. I think is what, I, I don't remember the... I forget, yeah, it's Metric, yeah, it's one of the telemetry a, a, projects. One right? of the tel telemetry sub-projects. So some of those are in there, and they're, th they already have, you know, um, their, their APIs are baked in, so they're not going to move. But if you're not to that point yet, some of the service plugin stuff, whether you're, it's, you know, it's a proprietary vendor thing or, or a new project, it would make sense to, to consider this. Um, actually, before we do that, Let's switch back to this. And so kind of a more full example 
uh, of, of how this looks, and so we're not just showing one function at a time. Uh, as an example of, it's, it's in our examples slash network slash create, I think is what it is. Uh, a bunch of our examples and a bunch of our, we have, there's a, a, script, a script out there that does sets up a Jenkins instance, and that's what this is kind of pulled from to kind of show how a lot of this stuff works together. Uh, walk through it, uh, sure, yeah. I, you know, as anyone who's uh, worked with Neutron knows, it's very complicated to set up a complete network. I'm actually creating a network is easy, but if you want it to actually work, it's very complicated. <laughs> so uh, this kind of goes through the steps, and, and what we've tried to do is kind of make this uh, method kind of idempotent so that you could run it over and over again, and uh, it's not going to mess up. And if some part of it blows up, uh, you could just rerun it and... So what we're doing here is we're first trying to find a network with that particular name that we're looking for. And um, the way find works is if it doesn't find anything, it, doesn't, uh, it just returns none. Um, and so if, we get, if there's no network out there with that particular name, uh, we create one. And then you know, we go on and create our subnet in, in the same kind of way where we're doing a find and then a create. And you know, here we're passing in, I guess this is uh, what Brian was talking about before, a particular example of where we're not doing uh, our ID to uh, resource mapping. Here, when we're creating that subnet, we're passing in network ID equals network ID. Uh, you know, we need to make a change in the subnet uh, resource so that it would accept either, you know, an ID or a resource, and yeah. that would clean that up a little bit. And at this point, that's like a two-line change that just kind of slipped by as we were doing this. It'll just, it'll be called network and the type, instead of being a string, which is it actually an ID, it'll become type of... Um, Resource property. Uh, it'll, it'll be a, a network.network .network class, and that'll, again, take either one of those. So uh, we're going on, and uh, you know, down below here, we're uh, querying our external network so that we can route packets outside of our uh, private network that we're creating, and we're creating a router with that uh, external that knows about that external network. And then uh, we're setting up some security groups and opening up uh, some ports on that security group for that network so that we can access, I think, up above it. You know, we're opening up 80 and 22 or something like that just yeah. so that we can get some basic access to some services. And we, we use this, this method quite a bit just as kind of like, a, you know, testing stuff. Um, we have a, a whole process that you know, creates a server and a network and um, uh, fires up a Jenkins server is kind of one of our little examples um, using uh, this network that we created here. And so this method is actually something we, we might add as an even higher level, uh, something like this, uh, to, to take on the task of actually setting up a network. So right now the current highest level is, you know, it takes care of your session, it takes, takes care of a lot of stuff, and that's these create, update, delete, all these methods. Uh, the ability to say, create a server and, and work, whether it's uh, a Rackspace server or a HP server or whatever it is, uh, be kind of agnostic between vendors. Uh, because with, with Rackspace, you get a public IP. Other ones, you don't. You have to get a floating IT, IP, attach it. There's a multiple step process. So we do want to have, and I'm not sure exactly where this is going to live yet. Uh, you may be familiar with a project by Monty Taylor called Shade which kind of tries to do some of this stuff where it says, just give me a server, give me a network, give me you know, anything that's a multi-step process and try to make that easier and, and abstract away a lot of the differences and, and make it into a one-step process for users. It's something we're, we're exploring uh, uh, soon. And something like this is the basis for a lot of that type of stuff. And uh, I guess that is basically it. We have... Um, if you look in our code, is is on Stackforge right now. I'm sure at some point that'll change to be uh, under the OpenStack umbrella. Uh, but it's called Python OpenStack SDK. That's the pip name for it as well. Um, our docs currently are not under OpenStack.org. Uh, they're on Read the Docs under again the same name. Uh, check out our, our IRC channel, uh, OpenStack SDKs. Uh, it's kind of a multi-purpose one. It's not just us. It's also the the uh, Go and dot, or dot .NET and a couple other things. The CLIs. Um, use all the, yeah, OpenStack client as well uh, it is there. A lot of the same people are there. Uh, and every Tuesday at uh, 1900 UC, UTC is our, our meeting. Um, usually goes for the, whole, the full hour. It's usually a pretty good time. Um, trying to, to make this stuff better and, and, and keep going with it. So um, 
Anyone have any questions? I guess if you have questions, if you can come up to the mic, uh, that'd be best. Or I can repeat it for you. Go ahead. I'm going to close it. Uh, OK. Uh, thank you. I, I like this project very much. I, I have tried it in Senlin and also in Heat, for Heat. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I do have two pain points. Uh, I think maybe I'm not the only unlucky guy. So I, I'd like to bring it up here. Uh, the first thing is about uh, listing resources. Uh, today we are assuming that all resources can be paginated, but that is not true. For heat, the resource type is not from database. There's no logic there to understand limit or marker. So maybe this is a generic uh, thing we I need to our, fix. I think our most recent changes have probably at least somewhat addressed your concern there as far as the pagination. I think Brian was it's touching a, on it before. Yeah, because we don't assume anything is paginated. We, we, we have support for it. And actually, if you don't pass, and some of these, the, the proxy methods, it, it, when, when they're implemented is, is when we figure out if it's paginated or not. Mm. And so we set a paginate equals true flag or, or a false flag. So we may have it mixed up in heat to where we either pass the wrong flag or whatever it is, but it, that's certainly a bug and that's certainly something we could fix because most things are not paginated, but we do want the ones that are paginated to be supported. So it's, it should be transparent to anyone whether or not it's paginated. Okay. Uh, my second question is about uh, the service plugin idea, uh, but my understanding so far is that that is mostly about inclusion or exclusion of some services, but uh, I was expecting that maybe there will be some additional logic we will provide for, for example, for heat. There are something done from the client side, for example, the get file function, it is actually passing an, some other files mm -hmm. to, be, to be included for stack creation. But today, that may be not possible. We don't have that logic in SDK. So you could do two things. If, if that's a well-defined like, thing, if the, the, the method you have that would do that, that could certainly be added to the, to the proxy or in, in, in the lower the resource level. No, um, no for, for the files to be included, there's nowhere to find. <laughs> it's on your disk. That's a local file to be uh -huh. included. There are some parsing logic from the client side. Well, we okay. could provide an API where they could, you know, pass the file name or. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that that's what we do have some. Uh, we kind of went over just the basic, uh, you know, create update kind of commands, but we also have some kind of convenience methods methods thrown in there at places. You know, like we have like a find available IP method, for instance, and maybe what you're talking about kind of falls into that category where. We need to have a special method that would uh, special for create for that particular or. service. Uh, the orchestration proxy would have, uh, or the heat proxy, whatever you want to call it, would have a particular method that would do what you're looking for. Okay. And you know, if that's part of orchestration, well, we should do it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So we're at we're at time right now. Uh, we'll certainly <coughs> stick around, but we got to shut the video off. So thanks everyone for coming. Yeah. Um, hope you had a good time. <laughs>